Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues at the University of the Vatersrand in South Africa. Um, I'll be speaking today about uh, drug-resistant TB outcomes as reported in a national case register in South Africa. Um, so globally, uh, nearly half a million patients or people developed MDR-TB uh, in 2013. Um, just shy of 100,000 of those were started on treatment. Uh, in South Africa, TB is a uh, leading cause of death, uh, accounting for nearly 9% of all deaths in the country. Um, there's a growing MDR-TB burden. Um, nearly 10,000 cases reported in 2013, uh, up from about 2,000 a decade ago. Um, MDR accounts for nearly 2% of new TB cases and just under 7% of retreatment cases. There is, of course, a very high HIV co-infection rate in South Africa, uh, reported as 62%, and uh, MDR-TB treatment success rate is quite low, just uh, 45%. So in South Africa, national-level TB data are uh, available from three sources. One is laboratory data from uh, the National Health Laboratory Service, and the other two are case registries that are maintained by the National Department of Health, one for drug-sensitive TB and the other, which we'll focus on here, uh, for drug-resistant TB, uh, known as EDR Web. So, so this case registration database has been in use by the South African uh, National TB Program since 2009. Uh, Paper-based registers were used for reporting up until 2012, and it's been web-based since 2013. Authorized users can uh, enter data from DRTB units, and the data set includes demographics and baseline and follow-up smears and culture results, treatment history information, HIV status, um, drug regimens, uh, drug susceptibility tests, and treatment outcomes. Uh, the model of care provided uh, when this cohort was uh, under treatment, uh, so diagnosis was made uh, by uh, drug sensitivity testing or line probe assay uh, on culture isolates. So this is prior to the rollout of GeneXpert. Um, and a first line panel of drugs was tested, including rifampicin, isoniazid, ethambutol, and streptomycin. Uh, patients who were confirmed to have MDR-TB were um, referred to uh, an MDTB, MDR-TB hospital for treatment initiation and tested for a panel of second-line drugs. Uh, those who initiated the intensive phase were, were kept as inpatients for either six months or until culture conversion on a standard regimen, uh, including a second-line injectable, either kenamycin or amikacin, and four oral drugs, uh, including afloxacin, ethambutol or ethionamide, and uh, terizidone and, and pyrazinamide. And then the outpatient continuation phase lasted typically for about 18 months, and it, it, it contained the same drugs just without the um, injectable. And then follow-up was done at the MDT, MDR-TB hospital on a monthly basis. So sputum was uh, taken monthly um, until outcome. So in our analysis, we, we looked at all, all patients who initiated MDR-TB treatment. Uh, and were registered between the 1st of January 2009 and the 30th of March 2011. Uh, they were followed for up to 30 months until outcome or censored, and we excluded transfers in. Um, the relation between HIV status and, and outcomes, including mortality and treatment success, was estimated with Cox proportional hazards models. Uh, and just a quick word on, on definitions. So cured, uh, these are standardized definitions uh, referring here, uh, according to guidelines, to uh, five consecutive uh, cultures negative cultures um, in the final year of treatment. Treatment completion are individuals who completed their treatment course uh, and did not meet the definition of cured, and those two together uh, are referred to as a treatment success. Individuals who are lost to follow-up um, had a treatment interruption lasting more than two months. Treatment failure was two or more uh, positive cultures in the final year of treatment, and those who died uh, from any cause were classified as dead. So uh, we started out with just over 17,000 patients um, in the data set, um, 3,000 of whom roughly uh, did meet, not meet the eligibility criteria, so these are individuals who transferred in, for example, uh, leaving us with just over 14,000 drug-resistant TB patients, um, 300 of whom uh, had no resistance to rifampicin, so uh, leaving us with 13,700 RIF-resistant TB patients. Of those, 128 were RIF monoresistant with evidence of uh, sensitivity to INH. Um, 746 were, had another form of RIF resistance, so RIF and streptomycin, for example, uh, but not MDR. And there were 12,800 patients who were resistant to both INH and rifampicin, so having MDR-TB. 
Of those, 8.5% um, or just over 1,000 had pre-XDRTB, meaning they, they had MDRTB in addition to resistance to a fluoroquinolone or a second line injectable. And a further uh, 1,400, or about 11%, had XDRTB, meaning they had MDR in addition to resistance to a fluoroquinolone and a second line injectable. And so in our analysis, we uh, included MDRTB patients excluding those with pre XDR and, uh, and XDRTB, so just over 10,000 patients in total. Baseline characteristics um, in the cohort, just uh, over 50%, 54% were HIV positive, um, with HIV status missing for about 20%. Among those with an HIV status, 67% um, were HIV positive, and among those, 74% were on ART. Uh, if we look at differences here, um, those HIV positive uh, greater. Um, proportion were female. Uh, there's very few children in the, in the data sets. Uh, fewer than 5% of uh, all cases were children. Uh, about three quarters were retreatment cases. Uh, very little ec uh, extra pulmonary TB being diagnosed. And as might be expected, uh, among those who were HIV positive, uh, smear positive was uh, H um, slightly lower than in those who were HIV negative. For outcomes, um, I'll just point out that this, uh, we're looking at individuals who had outcomes available. So uh, we're excluding individuals who are censored, it's about 6.5% of the total, and individuals who are missing outcomes, which is about one third of all patients. Uh, treatment success, we'll see it's about 44% overall, um, with little variation um, between those with uh, HIV and those who are negative. Um, death was quite high, about nearly a quarter. Um, and we see that it was quite a bit higher in those with HIV and in those uh, without an HIV status, whose, whose HIV status was unknown. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, loss to follow-up also quite high, uh, about a quarter of all patients, slightly higher in those who are HIV negative. And treatment failure was quite low, about 5% overall, with a little variation across the groups. If we look at survival curves, um, we see that um, those who had an unknown HIV status um, uh, experienced uh, greater death. Uh, I think what's happening here is uh, um, it may be that individuals uh, are, are dying early on before their HIV status is, is um, identified and they may be positive. Uh, the, when, when we classified individuals as HIV positive, we used a number of variables um, and uh, it wasn't always clear when the diagnosis of HIV was made. Uh, if we look at the results of our adjusted Cox proportional hazards model, we see treatment success. Um, HIV status uh, was not associated with, with treatment success, and, and very little was, in fact. Um, being male and uh, more recent year of registration, uh, we're associated with a slightly decreased hazard um, of treatment success. For mortality, um, we see that uh, HIV status um, increased uh, hazard mortality by about 78%, and also baseline smear positive and older age was also associated with, uh, with increased mortality. Uh, there are a few limitations I'd just like to point out. Uh, there is a survivor bias, so we've restricted our analysis to cases who actually initiated uh, treatment. Uh, and, and yet, of course, there is very high early mortality, especially for patients with HIV co-infection. So this being prior to um, a gene expert being rolled out, because a diagnosis was made with uh, DST and LPA, uh, typically patients would not be on treatment until a couple of months um, after the uh, sputum was produced, by which time um, many patients uh, have passed away. Uh, drug resistance was recorded in the data set, but drug sensitivity results were only available for RIF and, and INH. So if a, if a patient was tested for resistance to, say, a fluoxacin and they were sensitive, uh, those results would not be in the data set, so it wasn't actually clear if they were tested at all. Um, and as mentioned, outcomes were missing for about a third of patients. Um, we looked at baseline uh, characteristics of those individuals with, uh, without uh, outcomes. Um, and compared them and didn't see any uh, clear differences, although, although there is more missing data um, in, in that group. And then otherwise, the data set does not report things like adverse events or drug doses, duration on treatment, or reasons for treatment changes. So um, somewhat limits some of the analyses that can be done. And so in conclusion, HIV uh, infection was associated with a 
78% increase in the hazard of death and had no impact on treatment success. Again, older age and baseline smear positivity were also associated with an increased hazard of death. And being male or registered more recently were associated with a small decrease in the hazard of treatment success. I'd just like to thank um, our funders, USAID, and just note that the data presented here is based on that collected by the uh, South African Department of Health. So, thank you.